Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very glad to be here to meet you all uh, and to see all your faces. Uh, I have to say that I did not have much information about uh, who you are, but now I heard that you are, it seems that you are in a very advanced level of uh, astronomy. So uh, maybe some of these things you already know, but I will try to be at least uh, clear and uh, to be able to explore, uh, explain uh, clearly uh, what is it about. So I will speak about the, uh, the research. Yes, I will, I will uh, in case some of you maybe cannot follow English, I, I used Google Translate. I put the text also in Russian, but with Google Translate. So maybe it will have some mistakes. I decided to start from the beginning. Uh, the solar system uh, research basically started uh, with the beginnings of the astronomy. Astronomy is probably, you know, one of the oldest science. Uh, since the ancient people, they always used to look at the skies and they noticed some uh, regularity. But we think uh, that the cradle of the uh, astronomical science is in the Mesopotamia, Babylon, Assyrian uh, culture. It is located uh, in the region of today's uh, Iraq. Uh, here we have desert, uh, but uh, 3,000 years ago it was very green and fertile, ideal for expanding, for developing astronomy and other uh, culture. And so we use basically their knowledge uh, even uh, today. So they were the first one who, uh, that, uh, who defined the main constellations, uh, who used the degree uh, division of the angle into, three, uh, uh, into 360 degrees. Uh, they had a calendar with uh, 12 lunar months and so on. And in general, they used astronomy for navigation, for agriculture, for religious uh, rituals and so on. And their calendars used to look like this, like uh, there's some clay. Uh, this is a calendar in the, from this time, and there are thousands of such clay small tablets found in the, in the sand uh, of Iraq, but they are still not investigated. So basically, we still don't know what they knew exactly. This is just one example. And uh, here is a stone uh, where, of course, they used to believe that uh, the planets and the celestial bodies, that they are all gods, and the main gods was, was the god of sun, Shamash, and here we see uh, the priests, uh, okay, here are the priests uh, serving to the, this uh, god from the uh, Assyrian uh, culture. So they, of course, at that time there were no telescopes, they just knew about the uh, planets visible with the naked eye, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they also noticed that planets move, uh, that stars, they basically look like fixed on the skies and the planets move uh, in front of them because they are closer, we just see them uh, moving. We just go slightly uh, back, so here in this culture, now we have Wikipedia, we can, every one of us has an access uh, to a lot of data, but at these ancient times, there was only one center in which they had Wikipedia. It was here in the, in the Alexandrian uh, library, the biggest library at that time. So all the knowledge was collected in this library. So we see that Greece is quite uh, close. So the Greek philosophers were all influenced by this. Uh, they were collecting knowledge in this uh, library. And later, uh, this uh, uh, influenced other, uh, the other cultures also. We mentioned also the ancient Greece. They uh, were the first, we believe, that they used the word planet, which means uh, wander, wanderer, like here, the Russian word skitalets, I think. But uh, I, will just, uh, I will just mention two astronomers from ancient Greece. It is Claudius uh, Ptolemy. He wrote this uh, book, Almagest. I don't know if you heard about Almagest, but this was the first catalog of planets, of, of stars, also a thousand stars. But for us, it is important because he cataloged the position of the planets. And this uh, book was used also later by Islamic uh, uh, thinkers and also in uh, later European in Renaissance and so on. And the, the dominant view of the cosmos was geocentric. So they used to believe that uh, Earth is in the center of, of the universe. Uh, also the, the, earl, the earlier thinkers as well. But here we will, uh, there is one most outstanding uh, astronomers among the Asian Greek astronomers who believed uh, in a heliocentric system. So uh, he thought that all the spheres in the universe, they are rotated around the sun, that sun is fixed, uh, that Earth is one of these spheres that uh, also goes, actually he was right, 
and uh, that the rotation of Earth uh, makes appear that stars are uh, moving around the Earth. But the proof of this was uh, lacking because uh, they, they were thinking at that time, if Earth moves around the Sun, then we should see the stars from different angles. And uh, they could not measure that angle because this angle is too small, the stars are too far. We call this angle parallaxa, maybe you know about parallax. Okay, they could not measure parallax at that time because it's very, very small. So it was, okay, he could not prove and it was the, the geocentric uh, view of the world survived until Middle Ages, actually. Also, yes, here's the wor word planet means this one, uh, skitalets or whatever. Uh, this is one of the also uh, effect. This is one. This is how planets, the outer planets, look uh, when we observe them. They make they go a little bit backwards, then forward. They make some kinds of uh, loop. This is a map of uh, of of the all the planet the planetary motion from 16th century. Earth is in the middle. We have a small sphere with uh, moon, sun. And here we see that inner planets, they used to believe that planets make circles around the stars and here we, around the, the Earth. And here we see this main circle and small circles that we just saw in the previous slide, which are called epicycles. So here we see that this is not quite periodic, so it continues in another way. So if they continue, it gets very, very complex. So they knew that something is wrong uh, with this. And the, this map was created by Tycho Brahe. He was the best astronomer at this time, a noble man from Denmark, from the 16th uh, century. And m maybe you cannot see, but here are clear, uh, all the dates of the observation. So it was very, very precise and nice uh, for this time. At some point, he got a young collaborator, young assistant, uh, Johannes Kepler. And he, Kepler got a task to study the orbit of Mars. And he did also some additional observations and so on. And, but Kepler was mm, familiar with the heliocentric uh, views of our solar system. So he was, he started with, with that. He assumed that uh, the center, uh, that solar system is in the center. So this was the original drawings by, by Johannes uh, Kepler. And he noticed that there is a small uh, difference between the, the circular orbit on the, for the orbit of Mars and uh, that it's slightly different from the circular orbit. So, and he concluded that it is, uh, that is actually an ellipse, not a circle, but an ellipse. And this was revolu revolutionary uh, for that time. He also was the first who used the word orbit, which means uh, a path, a road. And here we see a car uh, going uh, along uh, uh, some road. He also uh, drew out his Kepler laws, famous, do you know Kepler laws? Uh, no, oh, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, but before we go to, to this, uh, let me just explain. Do you know why they make such loops? You have, and I don't have to say. Okay, the, this is the visual, this is the, 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 the optical illusion because they are further away, you know. Uh, does everyone know or, or I, I will explain. Anyway, okay, it just appears as they move backwards because Earth is a little bit faster than, 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 than Mars because it is closer to Earth. It, when, like when I'm passing by this chair, it looks like the chair go, goes background. So it is just, uh, it just appears as, uh, and actually this was the explanation uh, of these loops or epicycles with, uh, with, uh, uh, that gave Johannes Kepler. And now the three laws, I'm really sorry that I, I was not told that you are the super, the advanced level, but okay, I will, I prepare this. So we know that, uh, as we said, that the uh, orbits are not uh, circular, they are elliptical. The, the distance is changing all the time. And uh, this is the peri perihel, you know perihel, and a, a, a perigeum, do you know what is perigeum? If, in the, if the center is in, if, the, if we take Earth uh, the center, then it gea, gea is Earth, so perigeum. Uh, apogeum and peri, uh, peri, uh, periapsis pe, pe, and so on. It depends, in the generic name is pericenter and apocenter, so if you have any other uh, orbit. And uh, the Earth is uh, here in 4th January and in uh, 6th July. So it's not related to the uh, seasons uh, on Earth. The second Kepler law, also these uh, sectoral speeds are all equal. I, I'm, I'm really, uh, it's for equal times, this radius vector makes equal uh, surfaces. 
the consequence is that speed is not constant. Here it is, okay, I can ask, where is it faster, here or here? Where the planet moves faster? Okay, yes, in pericenter, here. So it's fast, slow, fast, slow. So this is the second law of Kepler. In its some sense, uh, uh, the consequence of the preservation of the uh, angular uh, momentum. The next, the third Kepler law also. We know that the, the period, uh, the period of the of the planet and the the, uh, the, the semi-major of the planet, they have this relation. So the square root and the, the cube of the planet are, are constant, preserved. And this is very useful, for example, if we observe some asteroid or any other planet around another star and we uh, estimate its period, then we know how far it is from the star. So this is also still used and uh, very much used, uh, this third capital law. And uh, okay, now I uh, feel... Uh, Okay, Kepler did know actually to explain why they move. Uh, he just measured. It is, this, is, um, this was empirical. Uh, he just measured, he brought his law without uh, uh, really understanding what, why they move and what happens. The first one who actually understood what's going on was Isaac Newton with his laws of gravitation, where he actually formulated this law that the force is proportional to the masses and uh, uh, inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Okay, it can be any system, Earth, Moon, uh, Sun, planet, uh, and so on. And uh, this was the, the first step in his theory, but uh, the second part was, uh, do you work with differential equations? No, probably no. Okay, he, the idea is to uh, be able to predict the position of the planet uh, in any moment uh, in future. And uh, for this, we need uh, equations which explain the motion of the planets. So it, uh, it was not done by Kepler, it was done by Newton. So he drew out equation for every position, but only for a system with two bodies. So later we will see that uh, if we include the third body, then we have problems. So this was the uh, Newton uh, 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 historical achievement. Uh, okay, but as we said, saw here in the Newton uh, law, we have, as I said, just two bodies, but in the solar system, we have a lot of bodies. Eight planets, sun, and so on, asteroids, comets. Uh, currently, we know about uh, one million uh, asteroids, and they all have mutual gravitational interactions. So the Newton law, you can imagine how simple it is comparing to something like this. We are interested to understand and predict the motion of all the planets, and basically this is not planets, the small bodies, and basically this is still uh, not solved. Uh, the, the asteroids are small bodies of the solar system. How small they are, it is, can be seen here. Okay, this is the largest asteroid, Ceres, the second largest asteroid, Vesta, and the Moon. So, and all other are uh, much, so it's basically, if we collect all the asteroids to one big body, it would be still smaller than the moon. So it is, uh, this is how small they are. But they are very useful to us to understand the laws of gravitation. Because this is something like a, I don't know, laboratory for, for us that we can observe. So this attempts to solve the, uh, the, the, the motion of, of, of the bodies in the solar system. Uh, produced a new branch in astronomy, which we call celestial mechanics. In Serbian, it's Nebeska Mechanika, in Russian, in this way. So it's the branch of astronomy that deals with the motion of objects, such as moon, planets, asteroids, comets, also spacecraft. And uh, basically, uh, the idea is, uh, as I just said, it is not yet completely solved, but uh, uh, it, we, we are still <laughs> trying and working on these uh, complex problems. The orbits, as I said, oops, okay, this is the orbit of the asteroid Tesla. The asteroids are in between uh, the orbit of Mars and orbit uh, Jupiter. Then here we have 18 asteroids. So we see it gets a little bit complicated. And here we have 1,300 orbits of asteroids. So this is a very nice picture. Looks nice. It used to be the picture of the day uh, before uh, 10 years. But basically, here we see many, many orbits. But basically, this is not a scientific uh, uh, information. We cannot conclude much. We can just look at these orbits, and we, we basically don't see any structure 
nothing, uh, 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 nothing important for science except the, the beauty of, of this world. So this is why uh, we don't use this uh, classical representation of the orbits. In, this, in celestial mechanics, we have some other sets of elements that we use. So probably you are familiar with, the, uh, with this system of coordinates. We said three in, in, in a three-dimensional space, we use x, y, z, and then if something moves, also there is the velo velocity, uh, chorus, so three components of the velocity. So with these six coordinates, which appear as equations. They are not just position. They are, as I said, uh, uh, Newton wrote equations for this because we need, we need how they evolve in time. So for each of these, we have certain differential equations, which are complex. So we don't use, we don't use this system in celestial mechanics. We go to another set of elements, which we call uh, orbital elements or Kepler elements. So we have six elements and six elements, so we can transit from one to another, and uh, these transitions are called canonical transformation. So these elements are listed here, semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, longitude of the node, argument of peri-axis, and mean anomaly. So here, okay, these are the Kepler elements. They are, we just use them in celestial mechanics. The first one, probably you know, semi-major axis. In the, the orbit is an ellipse. Semi-major axis is, you know about semi-major axis, okay. The eccentricity, also, the second element. Here we see that if B is equal to R, then we have a circle, so a circular motion. This is the equation. So here, are, at the same time, they give us the types of orbit that we use. So circular orbits that we mentioned, the uh, elliptic orbits. All asteroids have elliptic orbits. This one with eccentricity between zero and one. And comets, they have some comets, not all. They have parabolic and hyperbolic orbits, and they are uh, usually not bounded energetically to the sun. They just pass once and, and go. And uh, here, the same, uh, the same uh, orbits are given here as the conus uh, intersections is, uh, is the inclination. So to define inclination, we first have to define some reference plane. So if we study the solar system, the reference plane is the ecliptical plane. The ecliptical, you know about. This is the mean plane of, for planets. If we study the motion around Earth, then we use the equator, equatorial plane. So it is the angle between the plane in which the orbit is located and this reference plane. Here, this is the inclination, the, the Russian word. The next element is longitude of the ascending node. So there are two nodes, here and here. So in this case, it goes down, it goes up. So we choose the, the point where the uh, body goes up. So this is the ascending node, and here's the descending node. So this, this angle is uh, measured between the direction to some reference point and the line in, uh, of intersection of the, of the two uh, planes. So it is uh, this angle. And then uh, it tells us basically where is the plane located in the space, the orientation of the plane. The next element is argument of periapsis. It tells us about the position in the plane, the position of the, of the ellipse. So it's a, it is measured uh, here in this orbital plane between this uh, node line and between the direction to the pericenter. So this is the small, small omega, big omega. And finally, uh, the position of the, of the body on the orbit. So there's, uh, I put mean anomaly, but there are different kinds of anomaly, true anomalies and so on. So uh, with these six numbers, we, we are familiar. So this is the orbit of, some body around Earth. So it can be a asteroid, it can be a satellite, but here it will be probably a satellite. So the semi-major axis, as I said, tells the size of the orbit. Then the eccentricity, okay, to zero we have a circle. Then here it becomes more and more eccentric. The inclination of the plane here, we see how it go goes, in which orbit the plane lies, then we see the node, how it is the, the green line uh, down in the, in the reference plane. This is the node line. And here we have the pericenter, the orientation of the orbit in, the, in its orbital plane. And finally, we have the position of the asteroid here, the red small, here it is, the, the asteroid. So this is the mean anomaly. 
So these six elements uh, correspond to the six elements uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. So here we have several hundreds of thousands of asteroids. So uh, visible on this picture. So we saw the previous slide, uh, 1,030 orbits of asteroids that looks completely uh, disordered like uh, chaotic. But here we see that each point represents the orbit of one asteroid. So here is the semi-major axis uh, plane, the first, uh, the semi-major axis value, and here is the eccentricity that goes between zero and one. So each asteroid, the orbit of each asteroid is represented with one dot. So uh, the comets uh, known at this time in 2007 are represented with, uh, with, the bl with these blue dots and asteroids with orange dots. So for example, this point here, we see the semi-major axis, we see the eccentricity, and we can draw out uh, the orbit, we know how, how the orbit looks. So if we represent now all the asteroids in these orbital elements that we just uh, described, then we can have uh, uh, scientifically valid uh, important data. From this point, for example, from this slide previous, we don't see any structure. We just see a lot of orbits and nothing else. But when we look, and this is only 1,300 orbits, but if we look at this picture, then we see exactly how they are positioned and what is the structure of the, of the, of the, but how they are uh, distributed. And this is why uh, we use such orbital elements. Now we should also notice that asteroids are located here, uh, astronomical units, you know what is astronomical unit. The distance between Sun and Earth in solar system, we don't use kilometers, we use astronomical units, which is the mean distance between the Sun and Earth. So Earth is here, Mars is at 1.5, asteroid belt is here between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, as we saw here at the Troyans. First of all, asteroids are everywhere in the solar system, but the most asteroids are located here. So we see that there are some asteroids missing outside of this main belt, and we see that there are some gaps, some emptiness uh, uh, here in the asteroid belt. And these gaps are produced by the uh, effects of the planet, so that, that we uh, just saw. And, okay, this is the same region. Okay, this is what I do. <laughs> this is my, my uh, work. So the same region that you see here is now represented in another way. So this is what we call dynamical map, and it is obtained uh, on a supercomputer. So to take, the, to take all this big region, to divide it on a very dense grid of initial positions, as we saw, we imagine some asteroids uh, there, and calculate their stability. So there is, a, uh, there is a way to calculate how stable the asteroids will be. There are uh, Lyapunov exponents uh, and so on. Uh, and this is uh, calculated for 4 million asteroids which are on this uh, grid. The unstable asteroids, if they go away uh, quickly, so showing instability, we color this in white, and the asteroids that remain stable will be colored in blue. So we see that the stable part of the solar system matches exactly the location of the, of the asteroid belt. So this is like a nest, like a stable island for the asteroids. Also, this region here related to the Troyans, we see exactly that the populations of the asteroids are located at the most stable parts of the solar system. Also, this stability is largely investigated because we are interested, for example, if the planets will scatter at some point, if they drift away, leave the solar system, and so on. And these are one of these classical questions that gave, actually, the celestial mechanics. And there are a lot of researches related to that. Pla planets do move, the orbits of planets uh, do change, and in one of these simulations, Jacques Lascaire got that Mercury, in some hundreds of thousands of years, will leave the solar system due to these uh, gravitational interactions among the planets. As we said, Newton laws apply for only two bodies, but we have a lot of bodies, and this is highly complex what you ask. It is not difficult to really calculate the mutual perturbations, but uh, we can measure the effects. And this is uh, uh, how we know uh, that th they do change. So this is also done with numerical uh, integrations. Um, now these, these V-shaped lines, these are the so-called mean motion resonances. And they also have, uh, uh, they have a very specific structure. On the border of the resonance, uh, we see that this white line means the border is chaotic. And inside of the resonance, uh, we have blue region, which means it is uh, stable. So resonance can 
uh, kick out bodies completely from this position, or they can trap uh, asteroids and uh, to, to keep them for some while uh, in the middle. So if you look here, we see the effect of the resonances here because they clean up, uh, they clean up some uh, asteroids uh, from their uh, location. Now, how they work, the mean motion resonances? This is a planet, this is some asteroid, for example, and they all move along their orbits. So in this configuration, a planet uh, will uh, pull uh, a little bit the asteroid. This is the, the situation in which the asteroid is mostly influenced by the gravity of the planet. So it will be slightly perturbed at this location. So if uh, the asteroid is not in the resonance with the planet, then this uh, situation will, will repeat randomly along the orbit and they will cancel, annul each other and the effect is not very important. But if they, the periods are, for example, M times the planet makes a uh, circle around the sun and equals N revolutions of the asteroid, then it means that this situation will always repeat uh, periodically after M revolution of the planet and N revolution of the, of the asteroid. And this effect of uh, perturbation will accumulate with time and uh, the asteroid will be uh, kicked. This equation is basically the same as this equation. So if the period are commensurable, so by the third Kepler law, the periods here we see that the periods are common. So, so uh, certain periods correspond to equal this to certain distance from the sun, and this is why, from this law, we know how to estimate the location. Okay, this is the number of asteroids versus uh, semi-major axis. So certain resonance acts exactly at one value of the semi-major axis. We know this because the third. Kepler law. The strongest resonances are three to one resonance with Jupiter. So asteroid makes three rounds, or Jupiter makes one, five to two, seven to three, two to one is the largest resonance and the outer edge of the uh, main belt. Uh, there are also resonances with other planets, but Jupiter as the most massive planet makes the strongest uh, resonances. There are resonances with Earth. For example, all these small lines here, these are the resonances with Earth also. So this, uh, and we see that one rational number here, M divided by N, every rational number is basically one resonance. We have infinite rational numbers, we have infinite resonances. So the resonances are the, the chaotic border now uh, for each of these resonances now overlaps and generate all this big chaos that we see in the solar system. So this is how a chaos appears and uh, all these are the resonances with Mars. These are the resonances with Jupiter. I'm sorry, your question. Maybe I didn't get it right, but what is the uh, dark area on this? Here. Yeah. Uh, this picture is calculated. Uh, I will use just uh, okay, sun. Jupiter, sorry for the. So here are two population of asteroids. So the plane is here. This population I will speak later. We have two, uh, here are the asteroids, which, which we just saw. And uh, on the orbit of Jupiter, there are two families of uh, asteroids, which is also stable. These are the so-called Jupiter Trojans. So this plane, this picture that we see is here along, along this, uh, in the middle, goes through the middle of the Trojan region, through the L5 point. If, if we took this region, for example, if we take this line, then we would not have the green. Uh, for this line here, because here we don't have any stable island, this line, this region would not exist. So this is a population of Trojan asteroids. I will later speak about uh, them. Okay. Welcome. Also, it is very important when we drive spacecraft not to be drifted away. We are interested as spacecraft to reach the destination and not to be kicked out from the solar system. And this is why it is important to make such maps as clear as we can uh, to have a precise image of the uh, dynamics of the solar system. Okay, here I wanted to show you some databases uh, of, the, of the largest databases of the asteroid that we use.
we should uh, use some they are uh, some uh, like uh, online uh, available databases of all the asteroids and we use the data every time we work with asteroids and uh, the map we just saw were all calculated with the help of such uh, databases because they give us exact positions of all the celestial bodies in the solar system so we go back to newton's uh, law so uh, as we already mentioned, there are many objects in the solar system, and uh, we should uh, cal the ideal would be uh, to calculate all the mutual uh, interactions. So, uh, and we are far from uh, solving this problem. So, this uh, is something that Newton already noticed when he tried to solve the motion of the Moon with his equations. He failed. These uh, these equations diverge. So uh, it left it, this problem uh, is uh, uh, was not solved at that time, and later a lot of generations of mathematicians try try to solve the three-body problem, and it they, they, it's still not uh, solved. So this is the so uh, famous three-body problem here. Probably you know about this, and it is open. There are some reason why why uh, the, the, the equations do not uh, converge. Okay, but there are only, uh, for this three-body problem, uh, we have only special solutions. Uh, for example, if the third body does not have a mass. So this is the situation for spacecraft and situation for uh, asteroids. So this picture shows us one of these solutions for this special uh, case of the three-body problem. And we see that th these are some points here that we see, so Sun, Earth, Moon. Okay, in this case, we treat only Sun and the Earth, and the third body is the spacecraft, or the asteroid, or anything that is small. So we hear that there are some points, five points, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Uh, they are called Lagrange points, although these three were uh, discovered by Euler, and these two by uh, Lagrange. And uh, uh, they are stationary solution uh, for the uh, special case of the three-body problem. So probably the most easy, the easiest to imagine is this L1 point where the sun pulls the body uh, towards the sun, the earth pu pulls, so it's like the, the two gravitational effects cancel each other. So basically this is a stable point here, uh, a stationary point. Uh, the same happens with the L2 point from the other side of earth, and then we have from the other side of the of the large body, the so-called uh, the L3 Lagrange uh, three point L3 point. So all these three points are unstable, which means that you cannot stay in that point. It's like standing on a slippery hill. If something very slightly push you, you will go out very quickly. So it's uh, uh, nothing can stay there. And then we have these two points on the orbit of the of the planet, 60 degrees in front and 60 degrees uh, behind, which are called, uh, which are marked with L4 and L5, and these are uh, stable uh, points, meaning uh, that a body can stay there. And the population of asteroids, that the, the, the picture from before, it was in this, uh, in this uh, the map that, uh, that you asked, was calculated around this point uh, for uh, Jupiter. Here we see the uh, uh, asteroids and the two populations of asteroids, the so-called Trojans, here is Jupiter. So they naturally go, the asteroids will naturally drift. They are trapped uh, around these two uh, regions and they stay there. So these are the candidates for the most stable part of the solar system. So this is also largely studied by uh, theoretical uh, studies. Okay, the same applies for the Earth-Moon system. Again, we have the five uh, Lagrange points, and uh, each moon planet, so each planet has its own Lagrange point, and each satellite, uh, each moon of any other planet has its own Lagrange point. So since they uh, are stationary point in the space, they are very useful for a uh, spacecraft. We can send a spacecraft there and park there without uh, worrying uh, uh, of losing them. So here we have, okay, the same configuration with the Lagrange points. L1 is between the Sun and Earth. So if we are interested to study Sun, uh, solar winds, radiation, uh, space weathering, whatever, then this point is always uh, uh, exposed to the Sun. So uh, here are some of the spacecraft parked, which uh, the SOHO spacecraft, which studies uh, the Sun, also uh, other ones. So uh, they are at the L L1 point for the uh, Sun-Earth system. Then we should also notice here, we see the shadow of Earth. 
So the L2 point is in the darkness because it is uh, in the shadow of Earth. So if we would like to study deep space, uh, other galaxies, then we will park, uh, we will park, park the spacecraft here at the L2 point of the Sun-Earth system. And uh, here is the one example for, uh, this is Gaia. It is located at the L2 point. It's James Webb Space Telescope you probably follow also at the same point. This yellow orbit is the orbit of Gaia. And this here uh, blue line is the orbit of uh, James Webb's telescope. We see they are not located exactly in the point. There are large families of orbit around the Lagrange points, which, uh, which we use for parking uh, the spacecraft. And this is a Russian-German spacecraft. And now I heard that it was canceled. I didn't know that uh, I'm very sorry for this, but uh, it is in the same location as uh, as the James Webb and uh, Gaia uh, telescope. So the question is, how do we reach uh, the Lagrange points? Uh, the answer, this is quite new branch of astronomy. We use something, uh, we, there are natural ways that drive us uh, there. So this is one example of this way. So this is the, the one of these orbits that we saw. Okay, this orbit here is called Hell orbit. There are also Lyapunov orbits. This is Lissajou orbit, we, I mean, I didn't, prepare to speak about this, but okay, this is one of these halo orbits, and this is a natural way leading to the halo orbit, and this, there is, uh, there is, this orbit is actually asymptotical to the theoretical halo orbit. So the spacecraft will oscillate around the uh, L2 point uh, for a long time. So this red line can be also uh, visible here. We see that there is a whole collection of red lines so they are all orbits, these transfer orbits, going from uh, leading to this halo orbit. So all the all these orbits here on this, uh, they have the same energy, and they are all located on a on a surface which has a tube, uh, a tube-like shape like, that we see here. And these uh, surfaces are called invariant manifolds or space manifolds, and they are largely used uh, for for uh, space navigate, navigation. So this picture here is about 20 years old, and these tubes here are the so-called space manifolds that we saw in the previous slide. And uh, uh, by the astronomers of that time, when they just discovered the, the space manifolds, they were used as an idea for interplanetary uh, travel. So they should have a tube-like shape. This green line is one potential orbit that connects uh, the planets mutually. and. Uh, in future, hopefully, we will be much faster on our interplanetary ways using uh, uh, these manifolds. Now we also see that these tubes uh, are not uh, here at the Lagrange points. So they arise not from the planet. They don't, need, don't, don't lead us to the planet, but uh, to the certain Lagrange points. But here, this is an idealized system because basically we don't know how to calculate these tubes. We just know that close to the, they emanate from these, uh, periodic orbits that we saw. Here is one attempt to calculate uh, the manifolds. Here is the, the periodic orbits around L1 and L2. And here is, here is the planet Earth. And here we see uh, this is one of the most successful ways to calculate the tubes. We see that they, are, that they have a tube-like shape only close to their source. Later, become, they become too complex, they diverge, and we are not able to calculate them. So this is why we are still very far from this idea, but probably in the numerical simulation, I guess we will be able to uh, find these roads. So the future is in the space manifolds if we speak about uh, the spacecraft mission. So if we just, each line here is one trajectory. So if we placed, place some spacecraft, it will go exactly to the L2 point. Then there is another manifold going to the L1 point. Then there is another manifold from other Lagrange point. So the idea is to find all these tubes, find where they intersect each other, and in this way we will be able to uh, move from planet to planet without losing uh, any fuel. Okay, these are some of the orbits of the spacecrafts that were that are already uh, in the space. Here we see that they all make some rounds around the Earth and then uh, go flight. And as far as I know, very little used these manifolds. There is maybe a small number of, of uh, actually they just use one piece. They calculate the manifold, uh, one piece, what they can calculate, and then they don't use any fuel 
for this uh, part and then for uh, correction of the orbit they use fuel. So this is a traditional way uh, to use interplanetary trips. So the so-called Hoffman transfer orbit. So Earth, this is, we just give some initial velocity uh, to, the, uh, to the spacecraft and then park basically drive the object to another larger orbit. So we have to calculate precisely, for example, here is another planet. So we have, have to uh, just drive the object to another orbit that will drive us directly uh, to another planet. And then it will receive more speed from, from this planet, go to a larger orbit. And this concept of the inter, uh, for space travel was used uh, in the earlier uh, spacecraft flights. Now this picture is a very nice picture. Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and so on. Mars, here are the moons of uh, Jupiter. Saturn, the moons of Saturn, and other planets. And all these pictures are made from the space, uh, using spacecraft uh, during their flybys, and in this case, some landings, also landing to asteroid, who's achieved. And here are the spacecraft that went uh, out of the solar system already. Voyager 1 and 2, they are twin brothers, uh, launched in 1977. The farthest is the Voyager 1. Uh, Pioneer uh, also. And New Horizons, relatively new, uh, also uh, went to the outer uh, solar system, left the solar system. So the one that still operates is uh, we see where the positions are comparing to the other planets, and they make these uh, outer minor planets very far for only 40 years, and some of them even smaller. And Voyager 2 is still, still operates for 45 years, and this is the trajectory of Voyager 2. So we see that it had uh, quite a lot of orbital changes on, his, uh, on its uh, on way to the outer solar system. Here we see it even better. So it had a Hoffman orbit, as we saw in some of the previous slides. Then it got some energy speed from Jupiter. Here it changes its orbit. Similar then with Saturn, also changes the orbit, changes the orbit, and also gets some uh, velocity. Here we see the distance uh, from the Sun versus the velocity, velocity of Voyager 2. So it loses the velocity. Then it uh, got some velocity uh, from Jupiter, again, uh, in 81, it got uh, velocity from Saturn, Uran, Neptune. So we see that planets actually speed up uh, the spacecraft. So how it works? Uh, the spacecraft uses the gravity and the velocity of the planet. So the gravity will curve, uh, uh, change the uh, uh, trajectory. So this is the, but it will not speed up uh, the, the spacecraft. Uh, what uh, speeds up, it's the, it's the velocity or the motion of the planet. It's the, like a resulting force between the uh, speed, uh, the velocity of the spacecraft and uh, of the planet. And uh, one very, very illustrative example is uh, like if you hit a ball to a, uh, to a car, if the car does not move, then the ball will reject basically by a small speed. But if the car or a train is in a very uh, quickly uh, going uh, in front, then the uh, ball will uh, uh, bounce uh, uh, back with a much, much faster than uh, if the train does not move. So the same applies uh, to the uh, flybys uh, with the planets. The speed of the planet is what speeds up the spacecraft, but uh, also the energy cannot be uh, got, got from nowhere. The planet will actually speed down very little, but uh, it is not notable for such a uh, large uh, mass. But if we, for example, if we uh, take like 10 million spacecrafts, then we would slow down uh, the motion of the planets. So this flyby effect was first used in the Luna 3 mission for the, uh, for the mission uh, to the moon. Earth, this is the orbit of the moon. And here we see that it speeds up, uh, it speeds up uh, the spacecraft. And it was performed for the first time in uh, 1959. After that, it was largely used uh, in other space missions. When we speak about landing, this is much, much more difficult than uh, flybys because uh, you have to slow down the spacecraft enough not to crash uh, to the planet. Uh, for example, uh, we have to study uh, the gravity, map the gravity precisely. We have to uh, study the atmosphere of the planet and the land, the geography of the planet. 
So Mars, Mars here I had a link, have, have a link which also probably does not work. Maybe on the end I, I, I can show all the missions to all outer bodies and how successful they were. Maybe in the end, if probably we, have, we will have time to see them. So Mar Mars as the most explored planet. So many spacecraft mariner were sent to the Mars to map the geography of the Mars because we need uh, to find out uh, where to land. So here we have, uh, there is something that is called Great Dichotomy of Mars because half of the Mars is covered with mountains and another half is with uh, flat uh, uh, land. So of course we cannot land in a mountain, although probably the mountains are more interesting. We have to land in, in these uh, part pieces which are, which are not, not very high altitude. And they were probably Mars holds the record with crushed uh, spacecraft uh, because many, many of them failed actually. And he, here is one uh, example how the landing of uh, uh, Perseverance uh, looked some years ago. So the, uh, the Mars, uh, uh, this capsule entered into the atmosphere uh, in 120 kilometers above the ground. And the time to land is less than 10 minutes. So uh, it has to slow down. And uh, by this, uh, they used uh, this parachute. But the problem with the Mars was that Mars has a very thin atmosphere. So the parachute basically does not work well. So they also had some crashes. Then at some point, they uh, turn out the radars to uh, measure the distance uh, from, from the land. Then they map uh, the land uh, to see, to find a place uh, where, to, uh, where to land. And uh, then this car <laughs> is going uh, out. Then the motors are turned out because to slow down uh, the spacecraft. And then this, uh, the, these motors, this, uh, I don't know how to call it, it flies away and the, the rover is uh, landed uh, on Mars. So this, uh, this mission particularly is landed in a crater called Jezero. And the Jezero is a small village in Bosnia. So uh, we were very proud uh, to, to have uh, this crater <laughs> on Mars. And uh, I think in Jezero, in this small village, there is also a space a center. Here I also had a link which I cannot put now, not to complicate too much. So landing on asteroids was uh, more successful. Here are some asteroids which are, uh, on which we su su successfully landed. And here the Ryago and Bennu are, were the sample return missions, meaning that the spacecraft grabs a piece of land and takes it back to Earth. So there are super complex uh, operations. This uh, Itokawa Hayabusa failed partially, was partially uh, successful, but all the others were relatively uh, fine. So we uh, believe that asteroids are remnants from the early uh, solar system. So studying uh, a piece from, uh, from asteroid is a great privilege because they preserve the, the archi material from which the solar system and the planets are created. The problem with landing to asteroids is their small gravity. So in, with Mars, the problem was the unknown gravity and the unknown atmosphere. But here, the gravity is so small that when this uh, Osiris-Rex uh, spacecraft wanted to take a piece, it could not take because the, the gravity is so small that all the particles of the dust, they just jump uh, too quickly away. So it had quite a lot of problems to take uh, uh, the land from the spacecraft, but uh, it was not uh, possible, so easy. And uh, I would like uh, speaking about this spacecraft. Uh, probably you are also familiar with space debris. So this is the garbage from the neighborhood of Earth. There are 27 pieces of uh, satellites uh, 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 going around uh, Earth. So they can be very dangerous. It's not just the ecological uh, damage. They can also make physical damage because at this point we have uh, 670,000 pieces of small uh, debris larger than one millimeter. Then if a 10 centimeter object hits uh, a, 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 a spacecraft, it can completely destroy it. And we should keep in mind that there are stations with people. Mm -hmm. So they can be largely uh, <laughs> damaged uh, by this. Uh, by this uh, uh. And then uh, if a one centimeter piece uh, uh, junk uh, can, can uh, penetrate through the, through the ship and destroy its uh, shield. So we should, uh, this is a, very, let's say, modern. We have all these nice flights to the space, but unfortunately they make a lot of garbage which will be more and more present in the future. 
there is a basically all the, all the all the developed countries have their satellites and they operate for some years and then they do not operate anymore. They stay there, so it's a it's a problem, in general. For several uh, years, it will be even more. And here are some types of the orbits uh, around Earth. The low Earth orbits, uh, where the internet satellites go, most of the 84% of the orbits are in the low Earth. They are between 500 and 1,000 uh, uh, kilometers. We have medium Earth orbits on the higher uh, altitude uh, and, uh, and the geostationary orbits, which rotate together with Earth. And they are for very important for <clears throat> if we are interested to observe the same piece of Earth. So since they rotate, <clears throat> we like weather uh, satellites for the weather and so on. This is the largest dat database uh, uh, at the GPL. Uh, so let's say some asteroid. Okay, let's say asteroid Moskva. Let me see how it works. Okay, here we see the asteroid Moskva. And uh, here we see the orbital elements of the asteroid that we just uh, saw in the first slide. We see uh, the, the size. It is a 27 kilometers uh, big asteroid. We see the albedo. It seems that we don't know the surface, what it is made of. So there are no information about this. We can see who discovered the asteroid, for example. And here we see the orbital motion. Okay, it should tell us the position of the, of the asteroid, where it is now. Uh, in different coordinate system and so on. Okay, the other the other basis is here. For example, okay, here we have the orbital elements. The orbital elements from us to this this is the European Center in Pisa. So they have a, a database of all the asteroids. They are not necessarily equal to uh, to to the ones at the GPL. So here we see uh, the. Ephemerides, for example, if you would like to observe the asteroid. Okay, here you see the position of the of the asteroid for in case you would like to observe it. So you can basically put here any asteroid, for example, asteroid one, Ceres, and it will give you all the data. So here are all the known asteroids that we saw the semi-major axis. I should I should show this in a previous part where I spoke about the orbital elements. But these are the, all the known orbital elements at the moment. So here is the number of the. We see how the gaps, uh, how the mean motion resonances cleaned away uh, some of the uh, orbits. Here, uh, the red parts are the families, the asteroid families, because in history there are some uh, asteroids that crashed uh, together and they produced a large number of small asteroids. So we identify families by uh, uh, observing their spectral type. So if we uh, observe one large asteroid and then many small asteroids around uh, this big one with a similar spectral type, then we know that it should be that they are created from a catastrophic uh, event. So we can also use some dynamical integration to integrate the asteroids backwards to see how and when, to estimate how and when uh, this uh, crash happened, and we can estimate the composition of the large body. So there are families which have in the core, they have uh, one type of asteroids, then the surface is made of another type of asteroid. So in this way, we can estimate also the size of the previous body and the, the, the body from which uh, generated the parent body of the family, and also some other properties. There are also subfamilies, so crashing uh, in between uh, the families. And uh, in this way, uh, studying uh, this part, we can actually decode the history of the solar system. And this is now a very uh, actual subject. Okay, are there some questions? Why? Okay. Uh, this map uh, was calculated for only 500 years, which is extremely short for the solar system. Uh, uh, if we would calculate, if I have other maps uh, where, where I decrease uh, the time. So they go for 300, I can show, I, it's too complex to show it, I could show you other maps. When we decrease the time, then there is less and less chaos present on the map. And we, when we show like for 100 years map, then we have just one slight 
one slight line, only very little lines. But nothing works in the solar system on scales of 100 years and 500 years. So actually these regions are much more chaotic. If we would calculate this map for 1,000 years or 10,000 years, they, everything would be covered by chaos. So the reason is that the times, it's actually much more chaotic than we see here. But the idea of this uh, map was to, uh, the, to, to study the structure of chaos. Chaos is unexplored. So there are different, uh, chaos uh, has parts which are more chaotic and less chaotic. So looking at this picture, we know that this is not so chaotic. But uh, in general, on time scales in which uh, asteroids uh, stay in the solar system, it is chaotic. So we, we, they are, it is less chaotic than this part, for example. But uh, it is, uh, there are no population of asteroids actually there because there is still some chaos present, although it cannot be captured in a 500 years map. So there are also, uh, we should also keep in mind that there are uh, asteroids which are not yet discovered. And uh, uh, I have another video which I also could not show that shows us the speed of the discovery of the asteroids. And it is impressive how many asteroids are discovered every day, basically, hundreds of asteroids. So I believe in the future, when we have a better map with all these large surveys or telescopes, uh, we, have a, we will have a more complete picture which we can uh, combine with such maps and understand better the dynamics uh, of the solar system. Thank you. And I have a question. Uh, what is the most reasonable way to do with space deserts? How do you see it? Oh, uh, well, I think, it's my personal opinion, don't, <laughs> don't treat me seriously. Uh, if you remember the space manifolds, the tubes, that uh, maybe this could be also a future for uh, garbage, space garbage, because if, if there are really orbits that can drive something very far, maybe we could just shift them uh, to such orbits and uh, let them go. But this is completely my personal opinion. Uh, so uh, one way is to put them in the ocean, but they cannot be thrown to the ocean, basically. The, in, one of the ways is to, there is some graveyard in the Pacific where they send all these uh, spacecraft. But it's also expensive. Uh, you, if you move them, it takes some effort. So there are discussions about this, but there, basically there is not yet a good solution. Okay, yes. uh, I have two questions. First, about the reality of uh, deaths from asteroid attacks. Uh, because I imagine that uh, last big event, so named Chelyabinsk, uh, okay. It wasn't detected anywhere group from any sculpture program, about 200 telescope, 200. It is too small. It was 18 meters. Celebians was 18 meters. As it is a limit, uh, it's a limit of uh, asteroids that you may detect if it will uh, close to uh, What is the size? Minimum size? Uh, about. 100 meters. We cannot see anything in the, in the far space. 100 meters, 10 meters. 100. Uh, we cannot see uh, smaller asteroids which are smaller than 100 meters if they are far. Even if uh, even, uh, this asteroid is about 1,000 km per hour. It is close to your segment. Uh, it would mean that you observe the skies all the time. Yes. But uh, uh, the, you have, you need to have a, first of all, when they enter, it is, we saw how much, how little it takes to land. Uh, it quickly enters into the atmosphere. So these small pieces basically uh, uh, cannot be, uh, cannot be seen on time. So we believe that LSST maybe will be able to see uh, uh, the close asteroids to one meter. So, but in general, there is no way to predict the uh, such small asteroids, uh, which are tens of meters. No, no, uh, 140 meters. 140. Okay. Second question. You know, the, as you know, both planets and our uh, planets and uh, moons of Jupiter are in agree with Titus uh, Bode uh, law. What is physical nature of the 
This is very much discussed uh, in uh, science and uh, I, uh, there is no uh, explanation for this and this is why some astronomers don't believe in the reality of the Titius Bodero. But I, uh, it works in practice, although we don't have a physical explanation. And uh, in some conferences about uh, astronomical astrodynamicists, they, uh, they agree that they don't agree in believing to the Titius Bode rule. But the asteroid belt is, belt is actually located in a place uh, where we should expect another planet, which was not formed because the Jupiter uh, perturbing effects. So the Titius Bode law is observed also just empirically, but the physical nature is not... Uh, is not uh, uh, yet known, and I believe, I mean, some some serious astronomers don't believe in the Titius Bodero. I believe because it works in practice. So, and the perturbation of the other planets. You is, sorry, you ask about uh, the other planets. You just observe uh, the effect. Uh, if you remember the story about the mean motion resonances, you observe that something is perturbed when, uh, like. Uh, I don't know, when I go uh, to some field and immediately some wind starts to blow, then I will just uh, make a step maybe background. So these perturbations can be seen in the observations. So if you notice that there are systematic uh, change, the small perturbation, then you can uh, predict the presence of, uh, of another planet. And uh, one group maybe you are familiar with the planet nine, because uh, some years ago, some astronomers in Caltech, they noticed that a large number of comets enter into the solar system, with very, and they could not explain why. And then they said, okay, there must be a, another big planet that pushes, uh, that kicks, uh, like we saw in the effect of the resonance, that kicks the objects uh, in the inner solar system. And uh, of course, they didn't observe that this, this big nine planet, the ninth planet, and uh, they believe that they will find the planet, but now no one find, find it yet. But we know that there is some dynamical mechanism driving the comets to the inner solar system. And uh, one of the explanations could be also these manifolds, that the, the tube, if you remember uh, the, the picture with the tubes. So these manifolds are, here are also some traces of the manifolds, which, which I, I have it in my computer, I can show you later. And uh, my group believes that the manifolds are the ones who bring in the comets uh, to the inner solar system and not the planet 9. So they are going from one direction. Like, uh, uh, like these comets are flying for, from one direction. To, uh, uh, the comets, if you remember, the first slide with the parabolic uh, uh, shape, the comets make a parabolic turn around the sun. Is this uh, what you're There are just a lot of them from... Uh, a lot of comets fly from different directions to... Uh, they are, uh, they are uh, the comets, uh, uh, this one, okay, these blue dots are also comets. And these are the so-called Jupiter family comets, because they came from the outer solar system. Then we have comets beyond Neptune, that are also periodic, and uh, they enter and go away. And then we have far comets from the Oort cloud, which basically they go from all the direction. Yes, you mean uh, in all the direction in which sense? They go from all distances. Oh, well, you said that, uh, like guys in Caltech, they believe that uh, there are a lot of uh, comets uh, coming to the solar system because of uh, planet nine. Because of uh, planet nine, like in, in planet nine. Planet nine. Yes, and uh, like. Um, they just saw that the number of comets uh, increases, or did they see uh, a lot of comets? Uh, a lot of comets coming from one direction. Yeah, uh, the number of comets entering to the solar system was more. We believe that these comets should be kicked uh, by Uranus and Saturn. The arriving of comets, which was larger than, uh, so Jupiter can kick objects, change the or as we saw in the flyby, it can change the object of any of uh, any uh, small body. So the same applies to Neptune and to Uran, but the the number of comets arriving was larger than Neptune and Uran can uh, bring in. So they made up this planet nine. So to explain, yes, the, the answer is yes. Uh, there is a large number of comets entering to the solar system. And the explanation is planet nine can kick the objects uh, to the inner 
solar system. So basically, uh, there, there are something that we call close encounter. So if a planet, if an asteroid has a close encounter with a planet, it will change its orbit. Temp uh, for, for, it can end up with collision, it can fell, out, fell down to the planet, it can change the orbit, it can uh, uh, be kicked out from the solar system. So many of these asteroids, after close encounter, they just go out. It's also possible. Okay, here's one example where we put uh, on the map that you liked, uh, when we filter out the most chaotic parts and place some particles on that parts, on these most chaotic parts in the solar system, which we believe that these are the space manifolds that we mentioned. Okay, the F this is Jupiter and the small asteroids initially starting from the here. You see how Jupiter, after only one, here's the time. So these are not spacecraft. These are real aster uh, asteroids, fictive asteroids that we place. You see how Jupiter kicks out the bodies from the solar system after only one close encounter. In very short time. Basically, they will be all. So we don't need billions of years for the evolution of the solar system. If we are in the, in the right place, it can happen actually much uh, quicker. The same, uh, here they fell down to, they are from the inner solar system. These are not comets that came from outside. So we see that, uh, also look at the times, extremely short time. So uh, all these uh, uh, dots, uh, they were taken on the most chaotic parts on the map that we saw in the, in the first part of the talk. So this is how we select, so we know where to find orbits that will collide with Jupiter and that will be kicked out from the solar system. So uh, if we study the, such maps in more detail. This was actually published uh, some years ago and it had a lot of uh, public attention because it, it, it was not known before that it can happen so quickly. So we used to uh, simulate for millions of years to uh, observe such collisions and uh, if we map precisely the solar system, we can identify those places from which we have such rapid uh, dynamical uh, changes. Maybe I could also show you some some the other maps, maybe, how we select. Okay, this was the 500 years map that we saw. This is the map, the same map for 300 years. Now we see how the chaotic region becomes more clear for 200 years and for 100 years. So there is a hidden structure in all this big chaos that we did not exist uh, before. So uh, particles taken from these parts, here we take this part, one, one part here, take the particles and see how they orbit, this is Jupiter, how they enter to, to the inner solar system in only 100 years. There are several, this, uh, each uh, orbit is uh, colored with another uh, color. As we said, the blue, uh, we are in the L4, in the vicinity of L4 point, and we see how each point here makes a completely different round, uh, has a completely different trajectory. And uh, here, for example, this one is trapped in the hill sphere of Jupiter for some time, goes around Jupiter, evolves, and then enters into a resonance. When we see this is a five to four resonance and goes out very quickly. Then here again, it passes uh, straight through the hill sphere and then again goes to another resonance, three to two, and goes outside to outer resonance. So all these structures here, uh, we see that they are chaotic. We see that we are, they are basically completely unexplored and they have a great potential for future, first of all, to understand the behavior of some asteroids and to, uh, for future space missions. Because if we drive some uh, 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 spacecraft to one of these structures, we can, uh, we can have a very quick, uh, we don't have to wait, although Voyager made a great job with 45 years going so far, but maybe using such space manifolds, it could be even faster in future, with less space debris, of course. <laughs>